Okay, so this session, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, well, the, the fifth installment of Archetypes in the Middle Way, following on from the four previous sessions we've had on the series. And the title of this one is Integrating the Heroes. So this is uh, the first of the sessions on specific archetypal functions uh, that we're looking at and their, the role they could have in middle way practice. Okay, so as is my custom, I'm just gonna quickly recap some of the background, though it'll have to be very brief, just to remind you of some of the key points from the previous talks, previous um, meetings. Um, so the hero that we're gonna be talking about uh, is one of four functional archetypes um, that uh, particularly I talk about in my recent book, Archetypes in Religion and Beyond. And um, in the view of archetypes I put forward in that book and I'm trying to use so practically here, archetypes are understood as practical sources of inspiration. So, so we, we are fed by our contact with archetypal symbols. We're reminded of what we need to be reminded of. And we do that through association. And that association is embodied. So it takes the form of embodied meaning. Um, and I've also talked in the past about uh, the distinction between specific archetypal symbols uh, and the archetypal function in general for, for a particular uh, archetypal function. Um, so there are four of those which we're going to be talking about in a succession of sessions. Uh, the hero, the shadow, the animo animus, and the god archetype, each of which has a, a slightly different inspirational function for us. Um, so you need to distinguish those functions from specific symbols. Uh, so like a particular hero, say Robin Hood, is different from the, the hero function in general. Um, the God archetype as represented in the Old Testament, for example, Yahweh, is needs to be separated from the God archetype in general. You know, they've fulfilled that archetypal function for some people in certain contexts. Okay, so the archetypal function is universal be just because it's based on human function, because it's about based on what sort of makeup we have as human beings, as far as we can tell. Um, and um, I've also talked particularly in the last session, which was about religion and uh, archetypes, uh, about the distinction between meaning and belief in relation to archetypal symbols. So, so the meaning of an archetypal symbol needs to be distinguished from our beliefs about it. Um, and that's uh, particularly important, for example, with, with God, that finding uh, an archetype such as the God archetype meaningful is not at all the same as believing in God. And it's not necessary to believe in it in order to find it inspirational. And thus, if for it to have a practical role in our lives as a source of inspiration. Okay, so that's just a few bare bones reminders of some key points from the previous sessions. Um, but applying that, um, we're going to be talking about the hero archetype uh, in this session. So the hero archetype is a function, an archetypal function. Um, so we're going to need to separate that from specific associations we have with hero symbols. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll keep coming back to this point, but obviously one obvious example of that is that a hero doesn't have to be male or uh, martial or anything, any of the associations you might immediately have with the idea of a hero. Um, and um, <clears throat> so I'm going to argue that the, the function of the hero um, is to 
inspire the fulfillment of goals. Now, we all have goals because we're human, so that seems to be part of our makeup as human beings. There are things we want. Um, obviously, the things that we want in the short term are not complicated. You know, so say so you want a meal, you make yourself a meal, you eat it, you've got what you want. But uh, to get more complex things over time, we're much more likely to need inspiration. Um, so if you have a remote <clears throat> career aim or an artistic aim, or um, maybe uh, an aim to improve your relationship, something of this kind, so you, you're gonna have to keep coming back to that over and over again. You may drift away and forget about it, and then you'll need to go back to it again. Um, so that's where you need inspiration over time to fulfill your goals, whatever they are. Um, so that's where I think the hero can come in. Um, but a hero symbol is only going to function as such for you if it's the right hero symbol, which actually is associated with inspiration for you. Um, so it's no good taking a, a hero off the shelf and kind of pretending that, that this is going to help you necessarily. Um, <clears throat> so, so the idea of, of um, helping us getting the things we want, obviously there are kind of cheap stereotype versions of this, uh, like um, there's, a, there's a stereotyped idea, for example, of the, the Buddhist soccer Gakkai movement. Now, I'm not sure exactly how accurate this is, but I've heard that people chant for a Porsche or something like that. Yeah, so, there's, so we've got these kind of crude ideas of um, goals that might in some circumstances be um, pursued with the help of spiritual practices of some kind. Uh, and to, uh, you know, if you, if you think in terms of a very obviously worldly or crude goal, then this might seem to be a kind of diminishment of, um, of the practice. Um, but uh, that, that's where I think we need to think very much in terms of integration of desire. Um, so, so integration of desire is uh, a key aspect of the middle way, which I've talked about in various contexts. Um, there is a introductory video about it, uh, for example, on middle way society introductory videos section on the website if you want to find out more about it. Um, but basically, um, I think we need to start with recognizing, acknowledging that we have desires. You know, this is part of who we are as humans. And there is this rather unfortunate uh, expression of moral tradition as being uh, at odds with desire or in conflict with desire and, and the, uh, the ascetic tradition basically of trying to get free of desires, which is an entirely fruitless way of operating. Um, but uh, if we use an integration model instead, we can think of our desires as basically good, but maybe they're crude in some cases, uh, and maybe they're in conflict with other desires, whether our own or other people's. So they need integrating, they need bringing together uh, with other desires so that they can work in the longer term and address more and wider conditions. Um, so so these, our desires need contextualizing rather than denying, rather than um, saying that, uh, or telling ourselves that we shouldn't feel this, we shouldn't want this. Um, and um, yeah, having been just been traveling through Ireland, I've been rather recollecting of my, you know, occasional contact with the Catholic Church and so on, that, that, that how strong that ascetic um, attitude is in the, in the Catholic Church, particularly um, of the, um, the idea that certain sorts of desires are sinful and wrong, and so therefore you should try to, or you should just obey the, the, uh, the religious law to, to um, extirpate those desires. Um, so, so that's an expression of asceticism as a I think an unhelpful approach to desire. But if we're going to integrate our desires, then as I say, we need um, to work at this in a fairly systematic way, make it part of our practice. 
And um, that's where the hero can come in as an inspiration to help us do that, to prompt us, as it were, over time. Uh, so I think we all have heroes of one kind or another because we all have sources of inspiration in pursuing our goals. Um, uh, but the, the hero symbol is whatever has that function for you. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean the hero symbols that are culturally dominant. Um, so the hero symbols that are culturally dominant, uh, well, the, the, the one you might, you may or may not relate to the heroes in Lord of the Rings, for example, um, or um, in any given you know, film or whatever. Um, if you don't, then <laughs> there's no sort of requirement to try and relate to that hero kind of hero figure. You need to find what works for you. So obviously, um, if there are a lot of heroes that are presented as, as being male, well, heroes can also be female. Um, if they're presented as being masculine, the, the sort of uh, thrusting hero, as it were, then um, it's quite possible to be heroic in a more feminine way. Um, and now I'm talking about genuine on average uh, characteristics rather than gender as such. Um, hero symbols can also be socially marginalized people. So not necessarily the ones that uh, society normally recognizes as heroic. Uh, they could be non-human even, um, and they could be everyday people. Um, so people we actually know who inspire us. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'll come back to hero symbols in a minute, but um, I'm also going to talk about projected heroism and integrated heroism. Um, obviously how we can avoid projected heroism and how we can try to um, cultivate or make use of or relate to integrated heroism. So, so projected heroism focuses on a person or symbol uh, as, as valuable in themselves rather than being related to us, rather than having a function of inspiration for us. <clears throat> um, so, so if you project onto a hero, you may you identify with the hero, you want the hero to win, you want the hero to achieve what they're trying to achieve. Um, but that has no particular implications for you. So that might be the case if you're watching a movie with a hero and you're, you're urging on the hero, you know, are they going to beat the baddie or whatever? But if that's got nothing to do with you at all, then that's not going to help you um, in terms of inspiration. Uh, so it needs to sort of connect with your own process in some way. Um, but integrated heroism, on the other hand, um, involves a, a constant provisionality uh, in the, the goal and method um, well, of the hero perhaps as depicted to us, uh, also in the, way, the ways that we may follow the hero or imitate or be inspired by the hero. Uh, so, so provisionality, again, that links with one of the, the principles of the middle way. Um, so, so our desires may start off taking a particular form. We may have particular goals and ideas and beliefs about how to achieve them. That's very likely to change as we go on. Um, so that provisionality, um, you know, what you find with, with more integrated heroic narratives, more integrated hero uh, symbols that fulfill the archetype better, um, that provisionality is, is more present. Yeah, so, so we are inspired to be more provisional ourselves in the way that we uh, engage with our, or try to reach our goals. Um, so, so the crudest hero figures are kind of culturally stereotyped and projected and unintegrated. Um, so, so if you think about, uh, you know, for example, the, the martial hero who just defeats the enemy and lots of people in their group identify with that, uh, that martial hero. Uh, so like Napoleon or Churchill or somebody like that, for example. So, so if you're in their tribe, 
uh, you want them to win and they win and you celebrate that and you're well in a sense inspired by that but it doesn't actually change what you do very much it it just reinforces your relationship to the group um so so that's what i'd call a um you know a less integrated stereotyped and projected use of the hero archetype um, but there are many more um effective and helpful ways of using it Okay, so, so I'm going to talk in a bit more depth now then about hero symbols and about projected heroism and about integrating the hero. So, so hero symbols, first of all. So, so I just want to kind of survey some of the breadth of what we might find uh, to be a hero symbol. <clears throat> so obviously some of it is um, traditionally heroic and some of it might not be. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, yeah, if you think in terms of the archetypes identified by Jung and Jungians, uh, then uh, there are other archetypal categorizations that Jungians have, have found, which also have a kind of hero function. Um, so I think in a previous session, we talked, we discussed a bit the, the trickster, um, because somebody asked a question about the trickster particularly. Uh, so the trickster is identified in um, Jungian tradition, Jungian analysis, uh, as, a, as a kind of it's a combination of the hero and the shadow. So, so the the hero who is unpredictable, uh, who who might turn out to be not quite as good as we expected. <clears throat> so, uh, and that's an aspect of. Um, the difficulties of finding the right methods really of reaching a goal. Uh, are you gonna perhaps use methods that you might not have accepted as, as, a, as good enough when you start? Um, how utilitarian are you gonna be in your pursuit of your goals? Uh, I don't think there's an easy answer to that question. Um, does the end justify the means almost, the, 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 the trickster? Could be seen as somebody who keeps changing the rules as it were um, so you don't really know who's side they're on you don't really know if they're a hero or not because they might have good goals in the end but they might not um and you might feel the same about yourself almost if your methods become too dodgy uh, another similar example is the magician um so uh the magician employs magic to fulfill their goals so, well how does the magician do that? Well, um, <clears throat> the whole discussion about that there as to what magic is or what implications it, it has for us. Uh, I suppose crudely you could see magic as, as just a, a, a quick way of smashing through conditions almost of, of making things um, fulfill your wishes uh, rather than going through a complex, difficult process to fulfill them. Um, but magic can also be seen uh, as an oblique way of engaging with conditions. So, so it all depends on the, the role that magic is playing, I think, and how you understand it. But anyway, the magician is still somebody who's trying to reach a goal. So it can be a hero in that sense. OK, so, so other sort of variations in hero symbols. So you can have um, culturally or socially established heroes. Um, establishment heroes so so leaders usually for example kings who are heroic um so say uh king arthur uh charlemagne um napoleon i mentioned um henry v in in english history um you can also have revolutionary uh heroes who who overthrow the established order and are very likely to come from socially marginalized starting points. So Robin Hood is a great obvious example of that as, as the, um, not just somebody who came, well, possibly depends which story you believe, <laughs> whether he came from a, a poor of a background or whether he's really a disguised noble person, but, um, but particularly that his methods were about changing, upending things. So, so robbing from the rich to give to the poor. Um, okay, so, so, you can have a, a revolutionary hero um, 
And of course, there's Che Guevara and so on, the, the people who are literally revolutionary heroes in political terms. Um, or they can they can be the hero as heroin. Um, now I'm never quite sure about the word heroin because uh, obviously it's also can be confused with the drug, but also um, should you call a female actor an actress and so on. So there's a question of language there, isn't there? Um, so I prefer really to talk about female heroes, I think, but it's a, it's a matter of taste maybe. So, so the hero, uh, a female hero is not necessarily just a woman who is acting in a masculine heroic way putting on the sword and the armor and so on, um, but maybe an inspiration to goal fulfillment very much in the context of women's lives as they are led. So, so I think a great example of that is something like Ibsen's play, The Doll's House, um, about uh, a, a woman who is, uh, well, impressed really by her domestic situation in the 19th century. Uh, but but breaks out of it in various ways. And of course, the, the whole history of feminism contains a lot of um, further examples like that. Uh, heroes also may be pursuing social goals rather than the individual glory. So you don't have to think of the hero as an individualist. Um, so I think that the Chipko movement in India is quite interesting from that point of view. So it's a sort of uh, an ecological movement for protecting the forests in India, but some of the leading figures in it were uh, women with low social status um, and pretty much anonymous or, or not so well known women. Um, and they were um, you know, connected to the, the, the social and ecological goals of that movement. And we might think of them not so much as individuals, but as an inspiring movement of people working together. Um, <clears throat> a personal relationship may also make a heroic example more powerful. Um, so this is where we get um, the relationship between the hero and the animo animus, um, that uh, obviously you, you may be inspired by a hero because of a relationship, but, but um, Relationships are not necessarily about goals, particularly. So, so that's where I think there is still a distinction between the two. Um, an anima animus uh, relationship is not necessarily a heroic one, but it can be. So, so you may be inspired towards your goal by somebody who you also also find very different from you, who inspires you with qualities that are different from yours, but but that fill in your gaps, as it were. I'll tell, obviously say more about that when uh, we discuss the anima animus in more depth. Um, then the, the um, I've already mentioned the, sh the shadow function in relation to the hero, uh, the unpredictability, unpredictability and ambiguity of the trickster. Uh, so that also may be an uh, example of the heroic symbol. And of course, you could also get heroic uh, symbolic figures that are getting close to the God archetype. So, so Christ and the Buddha are great examples of uh, heroes that become God archetypes or, or are combining the two functions. Uh, and that's, that's where the, it's almost like the hero starts off somewhere where uh, we might start off or somewhere similar starts off as human, uh, but engages with things that, um, are on much more on the edge and difficult to grasp for us as, as, as some new possibilities. Uh, so, so hence uh, the the apparent contradictions in, in Christ's status as both divine and human, and the Buddha's story of moving on from um, initial um, well. Discovering the middle way is part of this, the, the story distinctively there, which is another thing I'll talk about in a future session. But, but um, the, uh, the Buddha also, according to the Buddhist tradition, gaining enlightenment and thus uh, having a, a brush with the God archetype there and starting to represent this mysterious wholeness beyond what we currently grasp. Um, 
<clears throat> so, so there's a whole range there of different kinds of figures that can be heroes, uh, which I'm just wanted to mention really to uh, help perhaps to put you in mind of some of what might function in that way for you. Okay, so a little bit then about projected heroism. Um, <clears throat> so I see heroism as projected uh, where the hero and the fulfillment of the goal is idealized as a goal in itself. Um, and it's disconnected from being a source of inspiration for us. Um, so uh, that could be the, you know, um, well, you could find it in all sorts of different examples. So I'll mention a few examples as we go on, but um, it, it very much involves a loss of responsibility, I think. Um, so the idealized hero substitutes for your own heroism uh, by, as it were, reveling in the hero's achievements. You don't have to do it yourself. Um, <laughs> You don't have to make that effort. Um, and I find that very much it. Well, so, so, so the, uh, the Christian idea that Jesus saves us seems to me to be a very strong projection. Um, because they, if Jesus saves us through his sacrifice, then we no longer have responsibility for saving ourselves. Um, and that's, that's very much uh, indicative of uh, at least the kind of process involved in projecting heroism. Um, and um, in relation, well, it, particularly perhaps on average for women, this may be combined with an animus projection. So, so you might have probably of the, the knight in shining armour. Um, uh, so, so if a, a woman usually responds, could be a man in some cases, responds passively to a hero symbol, um, the knight in shining armor who will save her, uh, then obviously she no longer has any role in this. She's leaving it to him to do that and substituting his efforts for her own. Um, <clears throat> so that will be another kind of, or another example of that kind of projection. Um, or it may take the form of the values of the group overriding individual experience. Um, so um, that's one thing I find striking actually about sporting here at Heroism and the way that uh, sport is celebrated in the media, particularly sort of nationally based media. Uh, so in the UK, it's obviously the, say the BBC and the way that they depict um, British sporting uh, you know, people who've achieved great things or like winning a medal at the Olympics or whatever it is. Um, so, so national heroes that are celebrated in that way in sport seem to be treated as such regardless of our own level of activity. Yeah? So obviously you could be inspired by a sporting hero to participate in that sport and do your own thing or maybe to take up something else. But, but it still involves you. <laughs> Whereas the odd thing about um, particularly passive spectator sport seems to be that there is this disconnect between what the hero is doing and what you yourself are doing. Um, in some cases, a very, a very striking one that, that the, uh, you know, you're slobbing out on the, on the sofa and the, the athlete is <laughs> exerting themselves on the track. Um, so the, the um, you can also see heroism as, as um, well, projected on yourself. So you can see, you can project yourself as the hero in your imagination. You can have an image of yourself succeeding in a particular way, which you can become fixated on. Uh, and that then becomes a substitute for actually engaging with the conditions of success in the longer term. Um, <clears throat> So uh, the, the heroic business failure seems to be a great example of that. You know, that, that actually from what I understand, statistically, the vast majority of business startups fail. Um, but you probably wouldn't believe that from the stories of how you can go get there and how you can get make your business succeed and so on. 
Um, so there's obviously a huge amount of difficulty involved in making a business succeed, and um, uh, which involves reading the conditions very carefully. Uh, but uh, heroism in some cases may just may be a distraction from that unless it's very carefully related to your own situation as well. Um, so then the generally the self projection of the hero leads to or can often be associated with one sided effort rather than balanced effort. Um, so uh, the idea of balanced effort is something you find in, in Buddhist tradition, uh, the idea that in order to make an effort, you have to actually not act in some ways, or you have to um, balance uh, acting and making an effort in certain ways, actively in certain ways, with um, not acting in other ways and uh, allowing things to happen in other ways. Um, <clears throat> uh, but rather unbalanced effort tends, tends to grab on shortcuts to, to goals, thinking that will fix it, but then it doesn't. Okay, so, so that's, uh, again, ex some examples of the ways that heroism can be, be projected. Um, so, I mean, if we do project heroism, if, even if it's just kind of watching a film, but not relating it to our own experience, say, I'm not saying that's totally bad, um, but that it needs integrating. Uh, so, so for further uh, helpful relationship to the hero, uh, we need to work on integrating that, that projected heroism, heroism. So integrating the hero is, is my key focus here, what, what I think we can um, make a, a, a practice. <clears throat> so, um, if we if we have short term or narrow goals for heroism and we exert ourselves towards achieving them, um, then you know they're very likely to create conflict in the longer run or not prove as satisfying as as we uh, hope they would. Um, so if you think of that of that um, person who starts a business and makes heroic efforts to build up their business. Uh, makes a lot of money um, and then they fulfill their dreams let's say of buying a mercedes-benz and or some other expensive car um are they then happy um obviously it's it's a, it's a truism isn't it that it turns out not to be quite what you're expecting and yet people fall for this again and again and again in different forms um so this is known in, in psychology as the hedonic treadmill and it's it's um, been uh, researched and identified it uh, psychologically as well as in popular folklore and so on. So so the um, hedonic treadmill is obviously an aspect of consumer culture, um, and projected heroism can be uh, linked in really with that that uh, you know the effort we make, the one sided effort we make to achieve something perhaps inspired by people who make that kind of one-sided effort, but we're, we're not taking into account the larger context, which includes our own longer term needs and indeed uh, the needs of the planet. Um, so uh, yeah, our, so our integration of the archetypal hero um, can be inspired by the hero's own integrative struggle. You know, so if we think about the hero in a more integrative way, and in, or indeed seek out integrative symbols for heroes to relate to, um, then that can also help us in being more integrated in our own uh, approach to the efforts we're making to fulfill our goals. Um, so, yeah, the the um, I mean the basic process of integration here, whether it's our own efforts that we're integrating or the the hero who is integrating their efforts, is that uh, when new conditions come along, then we need to practice them in a way by by not uh, absoluting our our old goals, absolutizing 
what we thought we were going for and just going for that, nor uh, too quickly switching to new ones, but rather reframing those goals to address conditions better. So, so we, we adapt appropriately without giving up continuity with what we were going for before. Um, so it's slightly changing our path, you might say, rather than going back quite often. So, so that kind of switch is something you can find in heroic narratives all over the place. And uh, particularly in um, Joseph Campbell's famous book, uh, Work on the Hero, he talks about the hero's journey. Um, so, yeah, basically, I, I think at the core of this is, is the recognition that heroes may need to be innovative. Um, they may need to think in a different way about what they're doing and what they're trying to achieve in order to be better heroes, in effect, because the conditions have changed, so they've got to change what they're doing. Um, just to maybe I should flag up a few examples of innovative heroes um, so you could connect with this. So, so uh, Gandhi is... One good example, I think. Um, obviously, any figure I may mention will also have their weaknesses and um, controversies and so on. Gandhi was certainly amongst those, but Gandhi um, used nonviolent direct action to achieve the goals of independence for India uh, in a way that obviously made a huge difference to the Indian independence campaign, maybe stopped it turning into uh, a war or a violent revolution. Um, and um, so uh, in the terms of the, the overall Indian independence movement, Gandhi is the innovative hero, yeah? He comes in and he changes the course of how people think, and the whole framing that people use in that context. Um, scientific heroes are another great example. So somebody like Einstein, you know, comes up with uh, entirely new understanding of uh, scientific theory, uh, which gives a whole new context to uh, scientific goals. You know, what is it we're trying to discover here? What kind of research are we going to do? Uh, well, you can only do that on the basis of a theory that makes it fit together. Um, so, so creative thought uh, can give rise to these kinds of innovations. And then maybe maybe another political example. So I thought of, of Franklin D. Roosevelt um, and uh, the way he was elected in Depression era United States um, with a new model in his time for how to engage with economic depression. So the, the application of Keynesian economics to stimulate through providing employment and getting people working and so on. Um, so that was breaking the mold in some ways. It was reframing what politicians should do. It was making government far more active than it had been before in addressing those problems. So in some ways, he also seems to have been an innovative hero. So, so these innovative heroes um, are going to encounter all sorts of difficulties because they're thinking in a different way from other people. Uh, they're going to encounter all sorts of hardships and difficulties in changing frameworks. Um, so that's what Joseph Campbell talks about. I think he talks about initiation as a crucial element in the hero's journey, uh, that um, the hero almost has to depart from society and may, maybe go into a solitary um, retreat of some kind, you know, like the Buddha did, going off into the jungle. Um, facing up to new hardships and difficulties. Um, maybe it's more organised by society in some way, but, but uh, you know, obviously initiation can be a rite of passage for young people. Um, but uh, either way, you, you face up to hardships and difficulties and you change the framework that you're using to engage with things as you do so. So you slightly redirect your heroism and your, your goals. Uh, but once you've done that, um, so maybe you've gone away and faced up to the difficulties of having new ideas and doing things in a different way. Uh, it's no good just doing that by yourself. You have to come back to society and back to your community 
and reintegrate into it. Um, uh, so the return of the hero and the reintegration of the hero into the community is also a crucial element of the integration of the hero in general. Um, uh, so, so what's previously only a maverick who might have just been ignored by the community then becomes a hero and then becomes recognised as beneficial in their effects to everybody. Um, so, so each conflict that, that uh, human societies face think, can only be mediated by someone having the courage to face the conditions and reframe the approach rather than just reacting or rebelling. Um, so that's where the middle way comes in. Um, but obviously not everyone who does this will be culturally recognized as a hero. Many may, and many of them may also be deluded. So uh, there's a whole load of difficulties involved. So, so going through this process of the hero's journey, whether we're thinking of a hero doing it or trying to follow it ourselves, um, I think it involves all five principles of the middle way. So skepticism, provisionality, incrementality, agnosticism, integration. Um, you, know, you have to have a sense of the uncertainty of what you already believe. You need to engage with new ideas provisionally. You need to engage with them incrementally so as to be effective in the way that you do so. You need to resist those who tell you that you, know, that you either accept the old ways or you don't, <laughs> that there's only two choices. Um, and you need to integrate that both in yourself and in society. Um, so those are the five principles of the middle way. Now, there's, there's a lot more I could say about those, um, but they will be uh, part of another series next year, hopefully, of these meetings. Um, <clears throat> so basically, the, the, the hero, the integrative hero, thinks outside the box, but thinking outside the box requires inspiration. Um, and obviously the further outside the box you go, the more you may be engaging with the God archetype rather than just the hero archetype. Um, the more you're getting closer to entirely unknown sort of new possibilities rather than just achievement as you conceive it. Um, so hence, well, both, both Christ and the Buddha had kind of going off into the wilderness uh, stories attached to them, yeah? So, so Buddha goes off, uh, he goes forth, goes off into the jungle and meditates, but also Jesus, in, according to the Gospels, went off into the desert uh, and encountered Satan um, and was tempted by Satan. Um, so there's... Uh, hardship being faced up to there, but also as a, as, a, as a guide through that hardship, the God archetype starts to come, come into this in connection with the hero archetype. Okay, so um, the hero's journey then, we could see as the kind of journey either us or the hero that inspires us needs to go through to, um, to reach a more integrated uh, goal, a more integrated way of reaching that goal. But there are various substitutions. So on along the line, there are, yeah, unintegrated substitutions for the hero's journey, um, which will just create more conflict in the longer term. So, so the um, <clears throat> one that I've already mentioned there is, is asceticism. Yeah, so, so if instead of, um, going through the hero's journey and then integrating with oneself and with our one society, the ascetic sets off to conquer him or herself. Um, it's sort of the, the ego trying to conquer itself, um, which only really makes sense in some kind of disembodied or platonic model of how humans operate. Yeah, so this idea that the uh, the mind is the prison of the body. Um, sorry, it's imprisoned by the body, and the body is a prison. Uh, so it's deeply disembodied. And if you if you 
try to adopt a more embodied approach to the hero, I think we need to be aware of the temptations of asceticism and, and clearly avoid it. Um, yes, it's self-contradictory and self-destructive, really, I think, to try and beat yourself all the time. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it's often confused with the integrative process and particularly in, in both Hindu and Buddhist traditions and in other traditions, you know, you get uh, constant mixing of uh, middle way type approaches with ascetic kinds of approaches. I think the only way we can make those work is by sorting them out in some way. Um, another kind of substitution, I think, is, is to uh, adapt only in one way, but not another. So, so, for example, you can keep the same goals unchanged. You can absolutize those goals, but just change your method a bit. Or you can keep the same methods, but change your goals <laughs> superficially. Um, so, so if you were, uh, um, yeah, for, for example, if you're uh, engaged in business, business ventures, so I talked about heroic business ventures earlier. You could do that again and again, you know, and so lots of people do it. So they engage in serial business ventures, uh, which they engage in heroically, and then they're defeated and then they start another one. So the goal, you could say, changes, the business itself changes, but the method you've adopted has not changed. Um, so one needs to be flexible in both respects, both about what one is trying to do and how one is trying to do it. Uh, similarly, you could also get stuck on the goal, but just superficially change the, the method uh, in an appropriate, appropriate way to reach that, that goal. Um, so, well, uh, in political goals, sort of greenwash seems like a, a good example of that. You know, so, so you might um, <clears throat> uh, continue to insist on economic growth, for example, but say we want green economic growth. Um, but that's probably not a big enough shift to actually address the conditions. Okay, so that's probably enough uh, for the moment. So, so just to conclude, um, so, so the hero um, may seem like the crudest archetypal function if you compare it with, with the other ones. Um, and it can be expressed very crudely in popular arts, like a film business particularly, um, but, you know, I think it's really important and acknowledging our desires as humans is the beginning of a transformative process. Um, so if we can stick with that transformative process rather than a delusive one based on some sort of self-projection, um, then uh, yeah, we, can, we can actually uh, make a difference. Uh, to and change their desires and to develop those desires in an integrative way. Um, but, but integrating desire is a, is a long and difficult path uh, where we need all the inspiration we could get. So, so that's why I think we need heroes in, in the long term. Um, we need to identify symbols that will help us realistically to uh, remain connected to our goals. Uh, albeit to our provisional goals. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and open to questions or comments. Do just jump in if you want to. Say anything? I was um, really interested in uh, what you said about the hero sort of blending into the God uh, archetype, the hero archetype and the God archetype in thinking about having a goal and then having not a goal, but an openness to possibilities, uh, new possibilities. Mm -hmm. And um, it, um, it, made, it made me also, at first I was thinking, well, um, the hero has to be concerned with the process 
of reaching a goal as well as reaching it. Um, but the God archetype is involved in the process of generating possibility, it seems. Am, am I distinguishing these properly? Uh, yeah, uh, you could put it that way. Yes, uh, I mean, I suppose I, I just take the, the God archetype as representing those possibilities themselves in our experience. I see, I see, yeah. okay. But yes, uh, the talk, talk of God as creative shows some of the ways we engage with the idea of creative generation, yeah, in through the God archetype. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thanks. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, a tricky, uh, an interesting transition, isn't it? That, that, that uh, yeah, God, God in a relatively pure form or any God archetype in a relatively pure form isn't changing. It's not got goals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so it seems weirdly other nothing to do with us whereas the hero is starting off like us and doing something different so, so that's why i think we need heroes to relate to the god archetype and that's where mm -hmm. figures like christ and the buddha can come in if they can help us to to bridge that that gap um, mm -hmm. uh, otherwise we're just stuck with something that's weirdly other that we can't relate to and probably just reject uh particularly if it seems to be commanding us to do things which we don't want to do. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Can you relate to the... Uh, the idea that you can use the hero archetype. Yeah, anyone like to develop that thought? Well, I at first had, um, you know, when you were talking about the archetype, just had trouble thinking of heroic figures for me. Um, and I liked your um, mentioning uh, in the note that you sent about the ecological movement of the um, Indian women. Mm. Um, that is something that I find really inspiring. Mm. Um, and the idea, I guess my sense of inspiration is connected up with sort of uh, the lowest, in a sense, doing the highest work, you know, or do, uh, arriving at something like that. Um, so I find I, that a, a new sort of sense of how the heroic figure or figures can be inspiring, um, and especially in the sense of a long-term goal, something really over time that, uh, you know, that you didn't be engaging in with others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a tricky kind of judgment involved when you're trying to relate to a group in some way, because because uh, I think there's the distinction between group authority and group solidarity. In the, yeah. You know, so is it, is the group as a whole um, something that inspires you because you feel like the people in the group in some way or you can identify with them in and the shared group shared goals that you may have with them um or you know can you separate that from the authority of the group and the the yeah. sense that the, the the group is um yeah almost insisting on a particular narrative that that has mm -hmm. to to carry you along yeah. so maybe maybe groups that are distinct from your culture or different, distinct from your situation, you know, like, so, so the Chipko movement is obviously probably for us, it's in India, all women in India is different from our own situation. Um, so it's, it's some ways easier to relate to a, a group um, heroism of that kind. I mean, but, easier yeah. in the sense of not being caught up in the sort of group think, group it, identity it, and so, yeah. 
yeah exactly yeah yeah um so so if you instead had a group like i don't know say the uk labor party or something like that yeah so so there's a there's a group there which is you could say is acting heroically to do good things for the country but there's all sorts of complications there and possible projections and and, uh, see what one would expect with a political group uh so it's kind of too close to home to to make a good heroic group (laughs) i see I've had a recent experience with uh, uh, the book uh, Act, of, "Act of Hope" by uh, jo- Joanna Macy and uh, Chris Johnstone, oh. <laughs> uh, and it, it it seems to me that the uh, the spiral that uh, I think Joanna Macy was the primary uh, creator of the uh, the the spiral of uh, I'm not sure what uh, the, the proper title of it is, but uh, the, 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 the process of maintaining uh, hope in oneself, active hope, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, helping one achieve one's goals, particularly in the uh, environmental uh, movement. But uh, start, the spiral is uh, starting from gratitude uh, honoring one's pain, seeing with uh, new eyes, and uh, and going going forth from there. But that that symbol uh, of of that process, uh, I found uh, really uh, really inspiring, mm-hmm. and and an enduring one as well. So was it was it uh, Joanna Macy as a participant in that process or just the process itself the process itself right I mean, she, she and uh, chris johnstone wrote the book and uh mm. you know mm. developed the ideas and the, those kind of things but the pro- mm. see that there there is there is a symbol of mm. a spiral mm. with yeah. down at the bottom uh i, I yeah. have it i actually i have it on my uh on my phone mm. Mm. took a picture of it yeah, that, I mean, that's an, it raises an interesting point, I suppose, is that we are, most often think of the heroic symbols as um, as human, but but you could conceivably have other uh, even um, more abstract symbols that might have that role for you if they if they're sufficiently inspiring in their effects. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, what you're talking about sounds. Um, does it relate, do you think, to balancing feedback loops and the idea of, you know, that you, although we are repeating our patterns in many ways, we could keep adjusting them through adding new elements? Well, uh, yes, I think so. And, and uh, keep, keep, keeping, uh, keeping it positive. Hmm. Yeah. But, but yeah, it is uh, it, it, staying open I mean, so starting with gratitude uh, kind of sets the, uh, creates the conditions for, well, you know, Mm -hmm. things are not totally terrible here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And and honoring one pain, uh, well, we're in pain for for a good reason. Uh, And then then there's a process of uh, seeing seeing with new eyes to, well, what 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 other what other alternatives? How what other alternatives can we think of or see to uh, to deal with uh, to to deal with the situation and 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 the conditions? Uh, seeing with new eyes reminds me of what uh, Robert was talking about with the hero's reframing Mm -hmm. of uh, situations and goals uh, with new information. And um, that's how you get it, um, get new information, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, in a a Buddhist context, the um, Sangha Rakshita is another person who talks in those terms about the spiral as, as, I mean, it's what I would talk of as, as balancing feedback loops really from systems theory. So, so the, this, this, the ways in which, um, although our 
human state leads us to cons consistently repeat the same patterns very often. We can do so with variations. Um, and, uh, so it's staring in, staying in touch with those variations and modifying them, that's the, the challenge. I have a, like, I think I have a very uh, easy time to be inspired by stuff. So I think my issue was mostly projection. Actually, when you talked about the projection issue, I definitely like, I think I had like a strong recognition of how I used to almost get like dragged out of my life by everything. Like if I would see something about surfers, I would get obsessed with it for a week or so. And then, or if I see something about, I don't know, people climbing Mount Everest, even though I knew that I'm not that kind of person would ever be able to do something like that. But then I felt like, oh, like for example, engaging dangerous stuff, I never do that. Or then I would think, oh, I never do any, like I should maybe quit science and take a social job or something because I saw some, someone doing that and I found it inspiring in a way. And it took me a very long time to figure out, like it would always distress me in a way because it was distracting for my life. And I think now I actually realize what it is. I think this was just a projection where you think, okay, you see a lot of things and they always inspire you because I feel like almost everyone that I see doing something can inspire me in some way. Mm. And then <laughs> I think, oh, maybe I should be doing this instead of everything that I'm doing, which is then thinking, okay, you need to be doing the exact same thing in order to fulfill this inspiration somehow, which yeah. of course is bullshit. But yeah, but it happened to me so much that I almost couldn't stay on track of something uh, or like, or it was difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, mean, I think I it's like, being too inspired can be a problem if you, yeah, if your mind has a tendency to project something. Yeah, the, I mean, there's a, a synthetic process, isn't there? So bringing together these different figures that might inspire us in different ways, I think, and, and making them compatible with each other. So they're not taking us off in different directions um, that are uh, in, in conflict with each other in some way. Um, and I guess yeah. also abstracting it a bit, so say I don't need to actually go out and do the exact thing that I saw someone do, but I can still, I can just say, okay, maybe I want to be, yeah, I want to be writing a story right now, so maybe I could take inspiration, but I could not, like, or like a while ago, like until recently, I couldn't really very well mm. abstract it in that way. I would get obsessed with stuff instead mm. yeah. <laughs> for like a short period of time. And yeah. I think this is the, this is probably a very good when you talk about the projection, I really realized that this was probably what it is. Like, that you think the source of inspiration can only be fulfilled, or that you can only follow the inspiration if you do the exact same thing. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so there is a. Um, I was thinking about my own past experience with with uh, philosophers, for example. So, so. I used to be inspired by different philosophers and, and when I first read them thinking, oh yeah, they've got it. You know, that's, <laughs> so this is the model to follow as it were. Um, but then realizing actually, well, if, you, if you apply a critical approach, then there are various weaknesses. Um, but that doesn't stop you still having them as a heroic inspiration in some respect. Uh, like David Hume for me is, is, is a great example of a, of a hero. So I'd rather admire him as a person and, the way he kind of challenged a lot of assumptions in his in his context in his society. Um, but I think there are all sorts of weaknesses in his philosophy, <laughs> um, but uh, that doesn't stop me, uh, you know, uh, synthesizing uh, his approach in some ways with other approaches. And and um, and in terms of, of his archetypal role, he can still you know, be an inspirational figure. So I think I got something out of reading his biography which uh, I wouldn't get just from reading his philosophy uh, and, and uh, engage with the person more. Lee, you know something I was thinking when you were, you were speaking about um, getting involved in different types of inspiration and kind of getting obsessed with them and so on and then letting go and going to something else. What I kept thinking of was it's such a, you have such a capacity to be inspired. You know, it bespeaks that. Um, and it reminded me of the, the uh, God archetype, or I, I like to call 
the God archetype, the potentiality archetype. But um, there are just so many possibilities of ways of being inspired when, uh, and anyway, that's what I heard. I heard your great capacity for inspiration. Uh, well, thank you, yes. Um, I mean, I think everyone has that capacity. It's just yeah. part of being human yeah. in a way. Yeah. yeah. It's just a question of whether we engage with it. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the, it often follows quite naturally in some ways from the arts, particularly. Um, mm -hmm. So so probably for me, it's, um, you know, my, my earliest study at, actually at university was English literature. Um, so I was interested in um, that kind of, the kind of human engagement you get with through that particular art form. Um, and, um, but in the arts, whichever art we're following, we encounter all sorts of symbols of uh, that can inspire us in different ways that you know, have archetypal value. So yeah, if, you, if we're casting around for inspiration, then the arts are possibly a good place to start. Okay, any other thoughts or questions? I would imagine one of the biggest archetypal functions that the hero might fulfill is actually to help us discover um, a shape for our life to take that we're satisfied with to a large degree and that we want to pursue. Hmm. Um, because, you know, as Leah was saying, that's kind of what maybe was happening there. She thought, well, this could be the way, this could be it. Hmm. And I think a lot of us have that difficulty. Well, what, what should I pursue? And that can change as you go through your life. You might feel that you're sorted earlier on and then later on not be sure or the other way around. Um, but yeah. An archetype that can help us in that way would be very useful, I think. And some yeah. of the functional aspects that you've talked about, I think, are useful to bear in mind when mm. considering that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good point that we may often need to change course in a sense. And the, so the more integrated our heroic archetype, then the more we might be encouraged to be able to change when we need to, um, rather than just be set on one particular figure and who's working in one particular way. Yeah. Okay, should we, should we move on to the practice focus then? Um, so, the practice focus for this time is uh, maintaining inspiration in our pursuit of goals without projective fallacies. Okay, so um, I've got um, five stages of reflection to think about here. Um, I'm just going to run through and, and explain those those stages really and and um yeah I'll, I'll share the um my notes with you before i finish actually on zoom this time so you can easily download the information okay so um the first stage of reflection i'm going to suggest here for maintaining inspiration in our pursuit of goals is to reflect on what our goals actually are um, so obviously there are short-term and medium-term and long-term goals. Uh, there are individual goals, goals that are shared with perhaps with your partner or family or goals shared with a larger group, even goals shared with all humanity. Uh, so, you know, like addressing global warming or something like that. Um, so uh, you could think about, you know, any of those, what, what is most applicable to you? So what, what are your the most important goals for you? Um, but we're trying to tend particularly towards the long term here. Um, but it doesn't matter if those goals, you know, they don't have to be very distinctive individual goals. They could be goals shared with others that, that you feel strongly about. Uh, so, so reflect on the range of your goals and then select 
one example of a demanding long-term goal for further reflection. Okay, so that's, so that's the first stage. Reflect on your goals and find one demanding long-term goal. Then second stage, so think about what difficulties or conflicts this goal is subject to. So to fulfill this goal, uh, there are likely to be all sorts of difficulties, particularly if it's a long-term complex goal. So there'll be changes in, in outward conditions, um, changes in people's responses to you, um, there could be opposed goals from other people. There could be opposed goals within yourself. Yeah, so, so let's take a quick example. Supposing you're a young person whose goal is to study medicine and become a, a doctor or a physician, um, then the outward conditions could change. So the financing you hope to get for your course to study medicine might disappear. People's responses might change. So the support you got from your parents might disappear. Um, you might get other people uh, suggesting that's not a good thing for you to do, that you'd be better doing something else. It's unrealistic. And indeed you might start to feel like yourself. So, so, so there's all kinds of possible difficulties you may run into. So we're trying to anticipate what those might be. Okay, so then the third stage, what sorts of integrative practice might help you in responding to difficulties or conflicts in your goal? So um, my integrative practice, um, well, I've, I've talked in various places about a range of integrative practices that you can think um, about. For instance, mindfulness or perhaps some embodied kind of practice. You can think about more intellectual, critical thinking related practices, which might include aspects of academic study. Um, you might think about um, artistic or other kinds of meaning related practice that bring you into contact with new possibilities. Um, and that would also include perhaps uh, ways of relating to others. So, so you could have a practice, say, of interpreting others charitably when you know, they're saying something that you might interpret as negative, but you might not. Uh, so, so think about what sorts of practices might help you to avoid uh, well, to overcome rather, to work through difficulties or conflicts in the goal that you're seeking. It's worth thinking through there, you know, not just not just vaguely and in general, but, but supposing it's mindfulness that will, might help you, yeah? So uh, take my earlier example of um, if you were aiming to study medicine, then, um, and you lost your funding, okay, you're really upset by that. You, it looks like it's really going to be really difficult now to do what you hope to do. It's your life's goal. How might mindfulness help you with that? Well, it probably would, because it might help you to avoid reacting to uh, precipitately to that event, to put it in a bigger context. Um, but it might also help to discuss it with others or find the right people to discuss it with and so on. So, so there are all sorts of practices that might help you in that situation. When your, your goal is thwarted perhaps in some way particularly. Okay, so that's the third stage, thinking about integrative practices that might help you. And the fourth stage then is thinking about the inspirations the archetypal inspirations we might need to pursue those practices. So what sort of symbols may have an inspirational effect in helping you to continue with and apply those practices to help you integrate and fulfill your goal? Um, 
so here I'm suggesting you can look for a hero symbol. Um, if you could find one that that um, you know, that you can clearly imagine helping you with the practice that will clearly help you. Yeah. So so there needs to be that link. Um, not just that the, the hero symbol will vaguely encourage you when you think about them, but perhaps that the hero symbol will help you in a in quite a concrete way with a practice that can help make a long term change for you by continuing with that practice. So there, I think that the hero symbol can bite much more, as it were, yeah, rather than just being oh, a nice thing that you can you know, enjoy, as it were. Um, and then. Fifth stage, how can you be reminded of this hero symbol? So if you're going to have a hero symbol, who's going to help you remain inspired? How are you going to be inspired? How are you going to come back to that hero symbol? Um, so you could, for example, have a regular reflective practice. So you sit down for five minutes each day, recollect the hero. Um, you could have some use of the arts, say you might want to uh, write about or draw the hero or something. You might have a simple prompt or something you use every day. So a screen saver, for example. Um, so I've got a, a screen saver on my computer of one of Jung's uh, pictures from the Red Book, which inspires me. Uh, keeps When I look at it, it very often just reconnects me to um, what I find inspiring in, in Jung's work, particularly. Um, or it might be... Um, prompts from other people. Uh, you could get somebody else to remind you of the, the symbol you want to be reminded of. Okay, so, so those are just suggestions, but um, so I'll just run through those five stages again, uh, and then I'll also share the document with you. So, so the first stage, um, <clears throat> thinking about reflecting on your goals, what are your goals, finding a long-term goal for further reflection. Second stage, thinking what difficulties or conflicts is this goal subject to? Thirdly, thinking what integrative practice or practices might help you with those difficulties? Fourthly, what kind of symbols can inspire you to continue with that practice to cope with difficulties? And fifthly, how can you be reminded of that symbol?